Welcome, Dr. James, to your interview with the Oxford Political Review, and thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. Um, just to start off the interview, I'd like to ask, we've seen a range of responses to the coronavirus. So we've seen the very stringent sort of response that South Africa has, where there's an alcohol ban, cigarette ban, you can't go for walks. And then we've got responses that have been criticized as being too lenient, like in the US or the UK. So is there, in your opinion, a sort of model response to the virus? And if there is, what does that look like? Well, there are two background points. The first is that there they are no therapies to do, to, excuse me, there are no therapies to deal with, um, with uh, COVID-19 and there's no vaccine. So all we have are essentially non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, and uh, the best thing to do for countries is to um, identify precisely where the infections are, to isolate, to contact trace and to introduce physical distancing. And so, um, and so, and to manage the epidemic, clearly there needs to be ongoing large scale testing. So, so the best response in fact, um, we've seen so far uh, has come from uh, South Korea was very good. That's early in the epidemic, okay? So South Korea was very good um, and um, Italy struggled a great deal. The U.S. is struggling right now in, in a major way. Uh, South Africa's scale-up was very impressive. It was very quick, very swift uh, and immediate. Um, New Zealand is very impressive in terms of its response. So there are a number of impressive responses, and there are countries that clearly struggle uh, to deal with it. And the more they struggle, the more difficult it becomes to manage. And how would you measure what a good response looks like? Is there such a thing as too strict of a response? do you think? Well, you can overdo it, you know. Um, the, the key thing is the risk levels um, vary from country to country. And the key dividing line, in my view, um, has to do with um, the number of citizens and individuals in a particular country living in a built environment as opposed to those who live in informal settlements. Right. Because, because if you have a large number of people in informal settlements, it's very, very, very difficult to introduce and then maintain, especially in low trust environments, maintain that kind of social architecture that allows for low transmission. And that's the problem that we need to deal with um, in an ongoing way. So I think this really kind of touches on the impact of coronavirus and how both the virus and responses to it would vary in an environment like a developing country. So just sort of touching onto that, do you think that the virus sort of poses specific and unique challenges in countries where medical supplies are few and poverty is quite widespread? So, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, the, there's an ongoing struggle everywhere to get PPE, uh, personal protective gear, as well as um, ventilators um, and other medical uh, equipment. So everybody's struggling to get access. Right. And it's a scramble out there and it's a kind of social Darwinistic for people to grab as much as they can. So it's, a, it's not good presently. Um, so that's one issue that's a global issue. Um, I do think that it's a particular issue uh, for countries in developing countries um, in that, that kind of world, simply because of budget problems that they may or may not have, and also they don't have the supply chain. So that's, I think it's a general problem, but it's particularly severe in the developing countries. So um, on the issue of poverty, um, poverty and low trust in government uh, is a toxic mix. Um, because the only way many countries are dealing with maintaining social distancing is pulling up the army like South Africa has right. and using the army back of the police uh, to enforce compliance and that can provoke and the resistance and so on. So that's a combination of people who are poor, who need food supplies uh, and where there is in fact no stimulus packages available, the access to food from poor communities 
uh, and people will go out and raid shops and whatever you creates creates a serious series of um, political problems that countries have to deal with. And do you think that developing countries have had a problem with maybe having lockdowns that are extremely strict, but not having the economic and financial packages to back that up or not having the distribution channels to back that up? Well, the problem with being overly strict is that it's, it's a blunt instrument because those countries don't have the ability to test, for example, they don't have the ability to isolate and therefore they don't have the ability to slow down the transmission. Right. So they pull, out, they pull out the heavy guns um, in order to do that. So, and that can be just overkill. And, um, uh, but the fact is that what you have to have in, in countries, if you want to slow down the transmission, you have to have social distancing in place and they have to find a balance between what it is that citizens require and drawing on the innovations in those countries uh, and having the police simply and the, poli and the army simply maintain compliance without getting heavy handed. So that's a balance that you need to find. And that requires clear communication, requires some financial smart backup, and it requires um, uh, countries doing the best they can in producing the kinds of PPE that's available um, locally as well. I think one of my main concerns is sort of what you mentioned that some developing countries or many in fact are kind of systematically disadvantaged in terms of informal settlements. How do you socially distance when people are living so close together? How do you maintain hygiene when people don't have access to clean water? Are there actually things that governments can do in a short space of time to try to mitigate these situations? How does one do that? Um, I mean, South Africa, to take that one example, has close to 12% of the population living in formal settlements. You cannot have social distancing. Often you've got five to six people living in the same room. Uh, there's no running water that's available for personal hygiene and so on. And what one does, and also when you shut down schools, uh, what kind of home education, internet access, to kids have to online learning in areas where there's very little internet access. And so, so all of those things have to be taken care of and government has a responsibility to look after its citizens when citizens cannot control the environment such as what you have with a catastrophe. And so um, um, when it comes to social distancing, I think that it is a really, really tough thing to get right. You just, you know, so there's gonna be a real struggle and our greatest fear uh, right now, the transmission in Africa, for example, is relatively slow. Um, there's some, a few spikes here and there that we are worried about. Uh, and we, th um, we are quite fearful that when um, the virus uh, takes off in informal settlements, that it will spiral out of control. And it's very, very difficult under those circumstances to ask people to... Um, you know, practice physical distancing and social distancing. So it's going to be a real struggle. Right. And is one of the main concerns as well that many developing countries, especially a country like South Africa, already has people with very severe and very widespread underlying health conditions such as HIV and AIDS or TB. And how does that play into a government's response to decide how strictly to respond? That's true. If you look at South Africa's health burden and if you look at the level of um, um, individuals being compromised in terms of the immune, immune system, um, that means that there is a high level of vulnerability. Um, we know this virus kills older people. Um, Africa, when it burns through the system, it will in fact affect older people more. And, and clearly those who are immunocompromised um, 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 will be particularly affected by that. So, um, so that's true. The, the, the good thing is that there is a, a platform, a public health and medical platform available in countries like South Africa by virtue of the fact 
that we've got such a high HIV infection rate and we managed to get that under control. Um, and we developed a platform largely for PEPFAR um, and USAID money to create that kind of platform. We also have platforms for dealing with flu uh, and therefore that's a, an advantage uh, that, is, uh, that other countries often don't have. That's, that's really interesting. And I think it also sort of raises the question, are nations and countries going to be able to learn valuable lessons with dealing with a pandemic like coronavirus for the future? I know a lot of your research centers around biological warfare. Do you think governments are going to be able to learn lessons from this in terms of dealing with a widespread pandemic or widespread health risk? Well, we've experienced, um, the world has experienced what's called the boom and bust cycle when um, uh, there's an epidemic outbreak or pandemic outbreak. People, you know, scurry around and find the resources and so on and so forth. Uh, and when the crisis is over, you lower your guard. So that is to come to an end. And what's required is sustainable financing, uh, not boom and bust financing, uh, and, and sustainable financing for preparedness. Many countries don't um, take advantage of what's available resource-wise. Uh, because they say, why should we invest in something that may or may not happen, like a pandemic? You know, it's a low probability, but high consequence event. So we should get countries to focus on better preparedness. That includes the U.S., which has really struggled and stumbled, even though it has the systems in place. Um, and often that's not about money, right? Better preparedness is to get the political culture of decision-making right at the top. Get that right. South Africa was actually excelled on this level. Quick decisions the right decisions um, and acted very swiftly. So you need a political culture that is, uh, that is organized. You need a chain of command in a system like this without being militaristic, but you do need an effective chain of command from the top to the bottom. Uh, you need to build trust with communities and you need to um, um, make sure that you communicate the risk that countries face very clearly in a consistent manner. You cannot have inconsistent communication on public health issues like this. The US has really struggled with that, you know? There's a tussle between the president and governors, no clear communication. It's confusing, so you need clearest communication. There's a whole range of lessons to be learned and we cannot go back to an old normal. We have to develop a new normal and we have to innovate and build those innovations into how we approach and live our lives in the future. That's really interesting. I was also reading a blurb on a recent book that you co-authored, one of 17 that you've co-authored, Vital Signs, in which one of the main recommendations that you make is that we need a more integrated approach to health security in South Africa. And that includes greater collaboration with the private sector and greater collaboration with civil society. If we had had those mechanisms in place before this pandemic, do you think that the response or the situation on the ground would look very different? And if so, how would it look different? Well, we have um, a, uh, an environment that can be described as a low trust environment. Um, and one of the areas that um, is affected is the attitude towards the private sector. Often the private sector is seen as simply being concerned about making money and not having the public interest uh, at heart. And we don't have in place organized systems of engaging with the private sector in a way that's productive. What has happened in the case of South Africa's approach to dealing with COVID is in fact, partly because the president himself, partly comes out of the private sector, is a much better system of engaging with, uh, with the private sector. I know the company Aspen Pharma Care, uh, for example, has been leading in the area of getting PPE into the country and making sure that there's a supply chain. But there are other companies as well. I mean, probably about up to 30 companies involved. So, and, and the main point about the private sector is not just the resources, but it's all of the skill levels that they have in their companies, uh, dealing with systems, and also a lot of the technological innovations that come with being better prepared and better responding including in the medical area, come from the corporate sector. They never come out of the state or the public sector. So, so um, but again, that has to be an organized system of engagement. It has to 
to be sustainable. This is an opportunity for South Africa to build a better system of linkages to the private sector. That's the one point. On the, com on the community side, simply to say that non-governmental organizations and civic support groups uh, play a massively important role when it comes to um, um, responding to an epidemic. You have to be able to reach communities and the best way of reaching communities is by working with uh, civil groups. Um, the, the Roman Catholic Church, for example, in the DRC was absolutely fundamental in beating the Ebola outbreak in that area, which we forget about that, but there was a very successful uh, eradication of Ebola in the DRC uh, over the last year. So dealing with churches are important. So, um, and for that, they, many of those groupings require funding, um, they provide the social support services in the communities, and therefore uh, it's important for us to get into a point where the civil society part of South Africa, which is often involved in protests and conflict and what have you, also play that con kind of constructive role, and we're beginning to get there. I was actually thinking that that would be extremely beneficial right now because the government, it seems like, is facing a distribution problem in terms of getting food to the people that they've promised food to um, and to the hungry across the country because there have been protests in South Africa that that hasn't been happening. But the government has responded by saying that there's sort of a distribution problem where they can't actually access all those areas at once. So do you think having a localized form of that form of distribution might help and civil society could play a role in that? There's no question that that's necessary. Um, so there has to be an engagement with that civil order. If you think about um, personal hygiene, right? So you're asking people to wash their hands every day. With what exactly? So what's required are sanitizers. We should roll out and hand out sanitizers en masse in, in, the, in the informal settlements, for example. So the very basic thing that that's food supplies, uh, food for kids who are at home. Internet access, we, uh, we did quite a bit of work on this, and the best way of arranging for that is with tablets using mm. um, the cellular services that are available in countries. Um, there's, there's also um, a DSTV, which works through uh, radio signals, which can be mobilized and so on. There are all manner of ways in which one can make that, that kind of linkage possible. Another question I was going to ask you in terms sort of in that line of developing countries is um, people have wondered what the impact looks like on especially informal labor who maybe can't claim UIF through their employers or haven't been employed for a while or have been employed in obviously um, non-formal non uh, non um, labor. How do we cater for these people? How do we even figure out how that chain works and where we can distribute or where we can help? So I'm not sure I can answer that question. Uh, it's obviously dependent on uh, local circumstance. Uh, the work that we're doing covers all, um, all African countries, uh, including South Africa, but all African countries. And the question of what happens to people who are unemployed uh, and how you support that uh, varies obviously by country. South Africa is uh, better resourced than most. And in, in South Africa's case, um, how you reach the unemployed and how you provide support to the unemployed in a country that's looking at um, anywhere between 25% to 35% uh, unemployment uh, is an issue. Um, but the systems required to um, distribute those resources, I'm not quite sure. I think um, you may want to ask an economist that question. <laughs> In terms of um, transparency as well, I think South Africa ranks pretty high in terms of how transparent they've been with the information that the public have, have been given in terms of both people infected by the virus and people who've uh, died by the virus. And online debate suggests that people are wondering if there's a balance between how much information the public knows and how much is important to tell to avoid panic and rash buying and hoarding. So do you think that there is sort of a balance or do you think the public should always know everything that's going on? So the, if you look at the WHO's uh, risk assessment instrument called the Joint External Evaluation, the JEE, you'll see there's a category called risk management. Um, and South Africa's risk management system um, 
is, is not the best, but it's not bad at all. And it has two components. The one component is honest. You have to be straight with people on this, okay? Honest communication, consistent communication, and clear communication in languages people understand about what it is they face in terms of the risk and what it is they should do in order to minimize and manage that risk individually. So, and the clarity of communication uh, is you don't befuddle people with, with high signs, but you also base your communication on, on facts and on the signs. And on that score, South Africa is not done badly, but that's the one element. The second element, which is what worries a lot of people, is, is called rumor management, right? And rumor management is about the stuff that floats around on social media, which is uncurated, uh, and where all kinds of conspiracy theories circulate. Misinformation, disinformation, misstatements of science. And how you manage that um, is a very difficult thing. Uh, we have the same problem with vaccine take-up issues. And so what you require is a credible message to people, a credible messenger to people, and also a way of maximizing absorption of the information. So, and uh, who's a credible me message depends on the country. In, in some countries, uh, they are priests. In other countries, they're sports personalities and so on. So what, what is important when it comes to what's called rumor management is to make sure that the people, the health people who work on the ground, uh, these are the community health workers who liaise directly with citizens are able to communicate the proper messages around uh, what it is one should do to manage the risk in a clear way. And you need to use all media platforms uh, and use credible messengers to consistently articulate what the risks are and what people should do in order to mitigate whatever rumors are floating around. Uh, so, uh, Do you think that certain countries have struggled with this? Do you think there's actually been active spreading of misinformation in certain countries? And if so, do you think that that motive is always political? Or do you think that certain countries are truly just not aware of how to handle the virus? Well, there's, um, there's an ongoing political claim that this virus accidentally came out of a laboratory uh, in, at the heart of the Wuhan outbreak. Now, that's simply not true, right? Sorry, there's no Professor ever James, um, you cut off. Could you please repeat the um, answer to that question? So you know that, the, that uh, what has happened is that um, um, there, there's been a large scale politicization of the issue. Um, and that was partly sparked off by the claim that, um, that the virus COVID, the COVID virus leaked out of, accidentally leaked out of a laboratory in Wuhan. So now there is absolutely no evidence at all that that, that is what happened. Okay, it's, it's simply not true. But that uh, then sparked up a response uh, by Donald Trump, uh, which was a response to uh, a claim on the part of somebody in China who said that this was a, uh, this, uh, the virus was, was there because of the US military, which is also not true. So you've got the cycle of conspiracy floating around. So. So it's really important not to politicize it, you know? Um, there has been an acceleration of pathogens getting into uh, human populations over the last 20 years has become more rapid. It's, become, it's, more, it's more, more, happening more and more, uh, and what have you. And these are natural events that we have to watch out for. Uh, we should not politicize it. We should not call it the China virus. Um, we have a global responsibility to respond to it as, as best we can. And so, and so conspiracy theories are utterly unhelpful and they should, be, um, they should be managed very carefully by countries in a very deliberate way. Thank you so much. And sort of on that note, where do you think international cooperation will play a role here? Some of the things that I was thinking about is sort of 
maybe debt forgiveness in African countries or just in developing countries in general so that they can better manage their financial situation or amounts of aid that can be given to developing countries? Where do you see sort of global cooperation and especially helping the developing world come into the play here? So the two elements here, on the first element, I think that uh, if you look at the figures released by the International Monetary Fund, the impact of uh, this pandemic on the global south is going to be catastrophic when it comes to uh, economic consequences. And there will be a requirement, um, of, um, if you look at the responsibilities and the resources of the world as a whole, for um, um, increased resource mobilization to assist countries. And what the mechanism for that is, is not entirely clear. The IMF has some very good ideas, the World Bank has some good ideas and, and, and so on. So that's the one area. The second area is, is bespoke funding uh, for countries to better manage epidemics and pandemics and to develop financial instruments to make that possible. And so I know there's a number of initiatives underway to look at better financing models um, for, for that purpose, including a better financing model to look after the WHO better so that it's not, it's not vulnerable to some of the big players playing football as well uh, in terms of money. How would, you, um, how would you comment on the WHO's role in terms of the pandemic? Do you think that they are doing enough to support developing countries with the fund that they've gathered? Do you think that that distribution is happening in the correct way? So, look, the, the WHO is, is an organization that provides the most in the world as the WHO and UNICEF, which is responsible for children's health. Um, and they utterly rely on that. It's not true for the developed world who have their own resources. So the WHO is a body of all governments. Um, it's a United Nations agency. It is model authority in the world when it comes to health, public health intervention. It, it may not have the design that we like, but it's what, what it is we have. And certainly over the last two to three years, it has seriously upped its game and it should be absolutely supported uh, across the board to function properly and to develop and deliver the services that it does de deliver. It's a technical organization. It's, it doesn't have any doctors. Uh, it relies on doctors without borders are often. So it's a technical organization that provides technical support to countries. Um, and um, it's not a flawless organization like anything else, any other organization, but it's done as best a job that, it's, that it has. It has been subject to, since it's a body of governments, it has to manage influence. Um, and it's been accused of uh, um, being soft on China. Um, I'm not sure whether that's true or not. Um, it's an accusation that's being made. Um, it does, it does, it is vulnerable to pressure by the big players in the world, including the US as well, and that has to manage um, being fair across all countries and doing the right thing. Thank you so much. And just sort of a follow up question on that. In a world of sort of globalization, we're kind of sharing both the benefits and the negative effects of something happening somewhere affecting all of us. Do you think in terms of health security, we can lay sort of certain foundations right now that will help us in the future going forward in terms of global health cooperation? Um, so the WHO is the architecture. Uh, international health regulations provide the regulations uh, and the norms and standards for dealing with epidemics and pandemics. So one way of better cooperation is to strengthen the WHO and to strengthen the UN agencies involved in managing crises on a global scale. So that's the one point. The second point is that uh, in 2014, the Obama White House through the National Security Council introduced a glo the Global Health Security Agenda, which is a, a new architecture to help the WHO accelerate the implementation of international health regulations. Uh, the funding for that has dried up um, and it's time to replenish the funding for the Global Health Security Agenda as well. 
that is involved in supporting health diplomacy because clearly uh, if you look at what's happened with the pandemic it requires the active participation of heads of state and um, and negotiations over global health is also part of the diplomatic world so we need to stop playing social darwinistic self-interested games and if you want global cooperation then what you requires the active support and participation in a global health security diplomacy. That is what we need to work on getting into the future. Thank you so much. I just have two final questions for you. Both of them are sort of pandered towards the average person watching this watching this video the first is when is the right time do you think to ease restrictions is there a balance that we need to find between pandering to economic and political concerns and then pandering to the the scientific concerns of the virus could you just repeat that you um that, that wasn't clear sure so I was asking, do you think, when do you think is the right time to ease restrictions um, on the lock, uh, un, un lockdown mechanisms? Is there a balance we need to find between political and economic concerns of opening up the economy and the concerns of the virus and the scientific community about maintaining social distancing? It's, look, this is a moving target and it's not clear what it is countries should do. Um, from a public health uh, standpoint, uh, if you want to lift restrictions, you do it at a time when it's pretty clear that the, the mitigation is working, that we're dealing with a decline in terms of infections, decline in the number of deaths, and that is accompanied by large-scale testing. It has to be accompanied by large-scale testing to know exactly how to manage the how to manage transmission, to identify the cases, to isolate the cases, and to make sure that those who are vulnerable get treated. So, and it's at that time that you begin to lift the restrictions. Um, I think it's a bad idea to lift it too early, um, and I think there's a smart way of doing that depending on where countries are, and that's an individual judgment call. It that uh, decision makers would have to take in terms of um, what to lift at what time. It's clear we can't go back to gatherings even, that, that will all be regulated now. Um, and so physical distancing will be part of our world for quite a while. There's talk about uh, the re-emergence of the virus later. So some of these things will be enduring and it may be that we are going to uh, a, a phase in the history of this pandemic where um, there is a kind of yo-yo between uh, increased um, uh, measures being taken, lifted in some ways, and then reapplied again. We should try and minimize that by being, by being you know, fact-based and watching how that virus behaves. Uh, as they always say, the virus will determine what actions we should take. So premature opening of the economy is, uh, is not a good thing. If there are public health concerns, at the same time, we need to get the economies going and those things go hand in hand. It's not either or, uh, because if the economies don't grow, there are no resources, taxes dry up, we can't have the public health interventions that we need to have because the financing is not there anymore. Yeah, so there has to be sort of a balance. And just my final question is um, about the way forward. How close do you think the world is to finding a vaccine or a cure? And if there will be a vaccine or a cure, how easily would, do you think that we will be able to have a distribution mechanism that ensures that everybody who needs any sort of a cure or a vaccine is able to access it? All right, so the, I mean, the scientific consensus is that it will take um, at least a year to have a vaccine, unless something special happens along the way, but usually clinical trials have a fixed you know timetable and you can't you can't accelerate it um, uh, just like that so this will come to be good to have it's a prophylactic which means you know it prevents the infection from taking hold in the first place um, uh, vaccines are distributed through UNICEF because UNICEF is responsible for children's health um, immunization is an issue that is taken care of by UNICEF 
when it comes to the developing world. So that this, it's a monopsony, right? That buys up all the vaccines and distributes the vaccines. So it requires a uh, distribution system uh, and that the planning for that should um, happen now and it's already underway. I know they are uh, busy looking at this issue and in working together with um, the private sector through the World Economic Forum principally uh, and the supply chain mechanism when it comes to uh, vaccines and with, uh, and with Gavi. Gavi is the vaccine initiative that's funded a lot of, uh, largely by the Gates Foundation. So, um, and getting the vaccines to where they are required on scale is gonna be a huge challenge. There has to be some rationing. Um, I can't imagine that they will have enough. So there will have to be smart ways of also vaccinating. Um, so the preparations for that should start right now. In terms of treatment, that's a different story, right? So those are therapies and um, there are a number of um, tests on the way to see what could be adapted, what existing therapies could be adapted. Uh, and right now, nothing is really very promising as we, as we sit here. Thank you so much. I think one of the main things that this has really highlighted for me is the massive need for global cooperation on this issue, not only in terms of countries cooperating, but actually cooperating with agencies like the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization. So thank you so, so, so much for your time. If you have any final comments to make for our viewers, please, please feel free to do so. Well, all I would say is that um, this is unprecedented. It's a novel vaccine. We don't quite understand um, um, how transmission works uh, in, its, in its fine detail. We don't know what will happen in the future in terms of uh, immunity. There's a whole range of unknowns, whether it will come back or not. So we just have to take this uh, in bite-sized chunks. And the most immediate thing presently is for countries um, to deal with this in a swift way and in a clear way. Uh, and that um, social distancing, physical distancing, and um, making sure that you mitigate at the right time is the most compelling issue that we all, we're confronting right now. Thank you so, so much for your time, Dr. James. I really, really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.